Okay, we'll officially get going. Good evening, I'm Mike Wabacher, the Executive Director of the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education way up in Roxborough. Hope you come for a walk. Tonight, we are gonna be talking about restoring the red knot, horseshoe crab populations, and the Delaware Bay. I can't wait to share that with you. But first, a couple of thoughts. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, if you miss it, we are recording the event and we will be uploading this to our YouTube channel. We recommend that you keep your microphone on mute and of course your video turned off um, if you don't wanna be visible. Um, we actually are screen sharing tonight. So the fourth uh, bullet point, I'm sorry, it was from, a pre from a, uh, another presentation. So if you don't wanna be in speaker view, you do wanna make sure you can see the screen. So do that. Uh, however, what is correct is during the entire presentation, make sure to put your questions in chat when we get to the end. Uh, this is the second in a six week series of Thursday Night Lives, kind of our spring semester. So um, next week, Billy Brown, he's a writer for Grid Magazine, does an urban wildlife podcast, great naturalist. He's what he calls himself a herper. Uh, people who love to look for uh, snakes, uh, toads, turtles, frogs. So herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. So herpers are what they call themselves. He's a great uh, amateur herpetologist, um, really knowledgeable about the reptiles and amphibians of our city. So snakes, turtles, and toads, oh my, next week at this time. And then in two weeks, uh, Sarah Dykeman is an outdoor educator who took a year off and essentially she traveled the entire migration route of the monarch butterfly. So she started on a bicycle and she wrote a book called Bicycling with Butterflies. She began uh, her trek 10,201 miles. She began her trek um, in the mountains of Mexico and then followed the migration north. She went as far as Canada, circled back and went, and went back to them uh, where they you know, in the fall migration in November. So I'm reading the book right now. She'll be here with us in two weeks. And I can't wait to present to you Sarah Dykeman, Birdie, uh, Bicycling with Butterflies. If you are new to the Schuylkill Center, that's wonderful. We are up in Upper Roxboro, 340 acres of forest, four miles of trails. We are free. Come for a walk. We've got a great visitor center that you can visit as well. So come see the visitor center. Come see our trails. Come for a walk. Love to have you. Like I said, we're free. We are an environmental education center. We've been doing programming for people of all ages uh, since the 1960s. So school programs are one of the most important things that we've been doing for all of that time. But we run a fabulous summer camp that is very popular. Uh, we do these Thursday Night Live presentations with you, nature walks, field trips, hikes, all kinds of things. So check out our calendar online. We operate Nature Preschool now in its ninth year. A couple of our preschool teachers are here. So a shout out to them um, for doing this with us tonight. Uh, but Nature Preschool was the first nature-based preschool in the state of Pennsylvania, which we are proud to say. And the kids are outside pretty much most of the day, every day, uh, even in the winter. So we're so uh, so happy to present Nature Preschool. It's so great for the kids. And I'm so thrilled that a couple of the teachers are here. Welcome. Uh, we also operate one of the most ambitious environmental art programs of any nature center in the country. The next show is called Companions. Um, it's opening uh, um, in April, um, on April 16th, and has a foraging walk to go along with it. So uh, Companions is an exhibit uh, created an installation, indoor and outdoor components created by Filipino American artists. So go check that out on our website. Do come to the opening, love to have you for that as well. We also have outdoor exhibitions, as I said. Um, this is the Mudif. Um, it's an Iraqi guest house built with Phragmites reeds. Uh, um, last year on Memorial Day, we started building the first Mudif uh, outside of Iraq in 5,000 years. So in 5,000 years of Iraqi history, they had always been built in Iraq. So we did one in Roxboro, amazingly enough. Um, this year at Memorial Day, we're having a ceremonial taking down of the Mudif. Uh, since it's weathered, um, 
it's it's we deeps were built for arid climates, not for wet, cold, changing temperatures, windy temperatures, wind, windy weather of Roxborough and Philadelphia. So actually, we're going to be doing a ceremonial take it, taking down uh, on Memorial Day weekend. So do check that out as well. Um, it was an extraordinary year in that the Mudeep brought together Iraqi immigrants in Philadelphia, uh, plus veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars um, who did some healing ceremonies and services inside the Mudeep. So we're thrilled, we're honored to create that. Love to have you for the deinstallation of the Mudeep. We also operate um, the only wildlife clinic in the city of Philadelphia, one of the few in the region, thousands of injured orphans, sick animals of all kinds, more than 100 species. Um, baby squirrels have started coming to the wildlife clinic. So it's, it's baby squirrel season, and that's our number one client at the wildlife clinic, baby squirrels. Um, birds who occasionally strike windows and are stunned, uh, like this evening, Grosbeak, also uh, are one of the animals that we service. Uh, and there's actually a program called Bird Safe Philly, um, where volunteers are scouring the center city looking for birds who fit glass windows and skyscrapers and the birds who are stunned are brought to our clinic um, where they revive and are let go. So we're, we're thrilled to have a, a wildlife clinic. Um, toad Detour is a great volunteer program. Um, toads wake up on our 300 acre forest and they, when they wake up from a long winter's nap, they wanna get across Port Royal Avenue to a reservoir uh, that's now actually a park. Um, and they have to climb up this, this side of this sort of embankment to get down into the reservoir. So their inclination when they wake up from hibernation is to get to water where the males sing, they mate, lay eggs, and the cycle of life continues. Um, so in those warm rainy nights of spring, the toads uh, wake up and cross Port Royal and trying to get into the reservoir. So I think this is gonna be a good tow night, actually. I think uh, later tonight, if this thunderstorm comes, that's gonna be great conditions uh, for toads. So we do have a volunteer program that helps the toads cross the road. We close down Port Royal Avenue. Uh, toad Detour is on, has its own Facebook page. So check out the toads on Facebook and actually you might get a sense if they're running or not. They might not be now if it's not raining, but I think if the rain starts, they might start moving as well. Um, I mentioned we are a volunteer program. Toad Detour is a great volunteer program. We do lots of tree planting, especially in the spring uh, and fall seasons. The Philly Fanatic joined us a couple of Earth Days ago before the pandemic and helped us plant this tree. Um, so check out our volunteer opportunities on our website. We're also a membership-based organization. If you're a member of the Schuylkill Center, thank you so much. We appreciate your support so much. We count on our members. Uh, to support us. Uh, it's, a, it's an important way that the organization moves forward. As a member in return, you get lots of benefits, including program discounts, advance notice, and um, discounts in our gift shop, which has the best bird seed in the Delaware Valley. So check out membership you can join online. And again, for our members who are here, thank you so, so much. So tonight we're here to talk about um, an extraordinary conservation story, uh, one of the most important ones. And I'm really pleased to present to you our special guest. Um, so as a, to ease our way into this story, and Larry, I hope I'm not gonna give away much, much of the story, but in an extraordinary confluence of ecological timing, each May thousands of red knots, a nine inch sandpiper with a terracotta belly, lands on Delaware Bay beaches, a key stopover on their 10,000 mile trip from South America to nesting sites in the Arctic Circle. Famished and exhausted, the knots arrive just when horseshoe crabs have pulled themselves onto those same beaches to lay eggs. Billions of fat, rich, BB-sized eggs giving knots the energy they need to finish the trip. But in recent decades, knot populations have plummeted from the over-harvesting of horseshoe crabs, and the conservation community has sounded the alarm about this bird and the horseshoe crabs in the bay. Dr. Lawrence Niles, the world's expert in untangling the knot story, shares the bird's astonishing migration, its threats, long-term trends, and strategies for saving bird, crab, and bay ecosystem. Lowry started his 40-year career as a regional game biologist in Georgia, and then spent 25 years as New Jersey's uh, chief of endangered and non-species non program. In 2006, he started his own company to pursue independent research and habitat restoration in Delaware Bay and elsewhere and is a founding member of the Horseshoe Crab Recovery Coalition. The Schuylkill Center is making a donation to the coalition in honor of Larry's work 
and with thanks for this presentation. And when Larry starts his lecture, I'll place the group's website in chat so you can support this important work too. And speaking of chat, place your questions there anytime. And when Larry finishes uh, the lecture, um, I'll read your questions to him. Dr. Lawrence Niles, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it so very much. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Mike. <clears throat> so um, I want to thank the uh, Google Center for uh, having me. The, I was reading your newsletter, and it, uh, it says that this is the year of restoration, which very appropriate to this talk, because this is what this talk is concludes is that we can fix it. So I'm going to uh, start with a um, just a brief primer on the migratory ecology of not. I'm going to go through our tracking study, uh, three different technologies, and then sort of what that showed us about the Arctic breeding area, the stopover on the Atlantic coast and the southbound migration all the way down to Terra del Fuego, and then uh, starting back up again, a stopover in Brazil, where they jump off and they go on to the Delaware Bay. Then I'll talk about what we're uh, trying to do to, to fix problems that you'll see. So uh, this is, when you think about red knots, you think, from the top of the earth down, because they migrate in uh, each of the major byways down to the most extreme portion. This is a graph done by uh, Tunis Pearsma from University of Groningen, which shows not only the migrations, but also each of the major stopovers that, uh, where the birds are used to get from one place to the other including Delaware Bay. And uh, so you see how big Delaware Bay is. So in, at this time, he, uh, we had our data showed about 4.6 grams a day. So a bird could build up that much weight each day. And uh, now we're up to about six grams a day, which is double all of the other stopovers. So that's how important the Delaware Bay is to the bird. Just a great shot of all the species by Jan van der uh, You could see down here is some semi palmated sandpipers. There's some sanderling, uh, red knots, of course, a few ruddy turnstones, and there's one dunlin up here. And then there's also short billed dowagers. So that's all the species that come to the bay every year. The way that we catch them, uh, we've used mist nets, but they're, uh, they don't usually work very well or not. Uh, so uh, we use something called a cannon net, mainly because the net gets out there really quick. And you could see in this picture how the birds all have their wings up. If the birds were up here, you see that would be a problem. So getting the net out really quickly, that's how we uh, put on these uh, tracking devices. So the first one is uh, called a light sensitive geolocator. That's a little light sensitive thing right here. And um, it, it, it doesn't transmit, it just records light. And it, it determines location in the same way a sextant would. So it's, you know, a sort of estimate of latitude and longitude. And you see, this is very crude. It's very beginning. We're just attaching these to leg bands. But see, this gave us the first understanding of uh, really the, the massive migration that's going on. Uh, this was one bird, uh, Y-O-Y. And uh, you can see it flew for 126, nine hours on the, uh, the southbound, on the northbound. And, 134 miles, uh, sorry, on the northbound, 134 hours. It's like, you know, that to me is just amazing. That's like almost six days long, just constant flying. 
The uh, next way is to call it nanotag. And so we were one of the first species to use the, this uh, emerging technology, which is it's just a short distance VHF transmitter, but they got it really small. We're using a lot on passerines now. And, uh, but we, in this application, it's sort of limited because you have to have towers. And there's over a thousand towers in the East Coast now, all the way down through, uh, through uh, South America. We put towers down in Cerro del Fuego and we got good data. This is uh, one of the uh, uses was to figure out if uh, the emerging wind power uh, farms are going to impact uh, red knots in their migration. But where we're doing a lot of work right now is on satellite tags. And uh, here we're attaching tags right here. Uh, we glue them on, we've been experimenting with other methods. So these tags, uh, they're limited in that they can only get 60 points, but the points are exact. And it's very useful to us in a variety of ways. Uh, like here's the track here of a bird that we attached a transmitter on in uh, Delaware Bay. And this uh, red line shows you the back and forth migration. We got it all the way up to the breeding area and then back down to the Atlantic Coast stopover. So I'll show that in a bit. But see how the detailed the, the movements were up in the Arctic. And then we also got data for the movements in the stopover, the Atlantic Coast stopover. This is just by Atlantic City. And um, see these locations are so detailed. I'll sh show more of this later, but the, the uh, detail is so great that it allows us to protect these sites. See, here's another one of a bird going down to uh, French Guyana. And we got movement uh, down there in, in an area where there's virtually no data. And then we got all this movement that is occurring at Brigantine. And see, we can put this into a, a system that uh, protects these sites, or at least is used in the review of permits, things like that. Another use is the altitude. And this is really interesting. We're just getting to it. Uh, but you can see that here's the movement of altitude. So this is just over time. This is altitude. You can see the birds constantly moving up and down. And if you look at this, the, this is wind, wind speed and direction. You can see that uh, the birds are moving up and down to find the following wind. There was only one portion of the flight where it had to oppose a wind, and all these others, it was a beneficial wind. So they were, they're moving thousands and thousands of feet up and down. So now I'm going to talk about the places. This map here is uh, the compilation of all the geolocator tracks that we did. So it's a pretty map. Uh, it uh, was done by Wendy Walsh at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So it's a gruesome picture. I got to show it to you because it really tells you something about why red knot can do this flight. See, they're not just, you know, eat. most most migrating birds only really gain about 10% of their body weight. I did my PhD on migratory raptors and, you know, the most they would do was about 10% because they were doing short flights and they could more or less depend that the next place that they stopped would have food. The, the knots, they actually absorb their, their organs of digestion just so they could get that little bit more fat on. And then they uh, increase the size of their flight muscles. So they're like machines uh, trying to make these very distant flights. But see, they have to they have to still balance that with the fact that the fatter they get, the more vulnerable they become. And see, that's the way it is for all shorebirds and all stopovers. They have to balance that that need for weight to get from one place to another with the vulnerability that just comes with you know having all that fat. 
So we're going to start with the Arctic breeding area. This uh, uh, adult uh, brooding uh, tick. Okay. Now the birds are uh, mostly uh, nesting in this area. I just wanted to put this in reference. We're down here, of course. Uh, this is a, a map from a paper we did where we put uh, transmitters on the birds in Delaware Bay. This is in the early 2000s. And they had short tracking distance. So the plane had about eight miles on each side with the antennas. This gray area shows you our, the plane's track. And so you can see that we did this flight. Each of these triangles are where we located birds. So this is generally the breeding area. We had to do this because uh, in the beginning of the collapse of the horseshoe crab population, which I'm going to finish up with, um, you know, the fishers were saying, hey, listen, it's not us killing the crabs, it's the Arctic. And they said, oh, it's the, the, the Third El Fuego wintering area. And so we mounted projects uh, with the help of um, Dodge Foundation, who we went to about eight years down in del Fuego and about eight years up in the Arctic. And we found that, you know, there's changes going on in these places, but not causing the dramatic changes that we eventually saw. I'll eventually talk to you about. So uh, this is the habitat here in the Arctic. It's actually desert. It only gets about 13 inches a year, mostly snow, but there is rain. And uh, so it's a barren area, which is a good defense for the knots because they just sort of spread out, you know, in uh, very low density. So we were getting about one nest every uh, square kilometer. So they're spaced out. Here you can see the eggs of the nest. This bird sitting on eggs. A brooding bird. And then here's the uh, chicks. The chicks are precocial, and so only about a day. And they're uh, following the adult. The uh, female uh, leaves. She goes on uh, right after the chicks uh, follow the male. And then as soon as they get the fledging age, then the male takes off, and eventually the chicks do. A lot, of, a lot of predators, like predation is the thing in the Arctic. And that's one reason why knots are in that very barren habitat, because it, it's not, uh, there's not enough resource there for the predators to search it. So that's their first defense. But there's Arctic fox, there's long tail jaggers, there's actually all three jaggers species, and then snowy owl. The birds leave the Arctic and they uh, they come down to the uh, coastal area. So there, we know of three sites. One is in Monomo, uh, I'm sorry, Mingan Islands in Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada, Quebec. Um, and then there's two in New Jersey, uh, two in the mid-Atlantic. One is at Monomoy Refuge at Cape Cod. And then there's two in New Jersey at Brigantine and Stone Harbor. This is Stone Harbor. You can see with the threat there because the birds are coming down in August. So this is the uh, peak time for recreation beaches in New Jersey. Um, in this stopover, we get both short distance and long distance knots. So it's the knots that uh, either go to the wintering areas in Florida and the Caribbean, which we're calling short distance, because they just hop down the coast. They don't make big, long ocean flights. They don't build up weight like the birds that have to go to Terra del Fuego. And then we have the long distance birds, like here you can see a, a bird that we banded in Chile. Now, in the southbound stopovers, the birds are building weight just like in the north bend. So this bird here probably weighs somewhere in the area of 200 grams. And we've caught birds up to 240 grams in, uh, in the, the uh, brigantine. 
And a fat-free weight for a knot is about 125 grams. So this is a big, a, a lot of weight, makes them very vulnerable. You see, we could tell the long and short distance birds because of this, uh, because of molt patterns in the flight feather. It's the long distance bird. They don't molt their flight feathers until they get to the wintering area. So they're flying with, uh, you know, worn out feathers uh, that they just live with as they uh, make their way, you know, 10,000 miles. This is a short distance bird. You can see that she's molding her flight feathers here. There's very different, uh, very different strategy for these birds. Most of the long distance birds leave the stopover before September. If I was in an audience, I would ask people now why they think that would be. Uh, and I'll answer that in a bit. So the long distance birds are out by beginning of September. The short distance birds actually molt their flight feathers in the stopover. They don't leave until uh, usually until about December. And then the third group of birds we see in the stopover are the juveniles. You can tell these birds because they have these brand new feathers. They're uh, really beautiful birds, all the detail. So this is the problem. We now have peregrines nesting on the Atlantic coast. See, the strategy that the, that the uh, birds were following was uh, basically discovered by a, a researcher out in the West Coast, where they learned that Dunlin and Western sandpipers timed their migration around the peregrine migration. The Western sandpipers would go before it started and the Dunlin would go after. We think that the nut, the short distance birds are going after the peregrine migration and the short, the long distance birds are leaving before. The thing that messed it all up was, uh, you know, I have to take some credit. We restored peregrine falcons. And uh, this project started in, when I was uh, with the New Jersey Endangered Species Program, and we uh, established peregrines on the coast because you couldn't do it in the cliffs where they originally occurred because great, hound out, great horned owls were killing all the young birds. So we did it out in the coast. The problem was they came back and they nested in the towers. So now we got peregrines uh, in the spring stopover in Delaware Bay where the birds didn't evolve to, to, to deal with that. And we have them in the South Town stopover. I'll talk a bit more about that later. I'm not going to say much about the Florida stopover. This is the problem, but it's not that much of an issue because birds can move wherever they want. So there's birds in Cuba and all the most of the Caribbean islands. So there's a lot of the winter population doesn't use a lot of energy. They just have to keep their weight up. I want to talk about the the, uh, the wintering area in Bahia Lomas and uh, Chile in Cerro del Fuego. So um, this is uh, Chile here, and then Argentina, Bay of Lomas is right here, right at the tip. This is uh, Cape Horn out here. So uh, before the, the uh, red knot population declined, there were small populations of these long distance birds all along the coast here, up and up through Argentina. But as the decline, occurred it all they all collapsed down into this one day bay alone there's both uh knots and hudsonian godwits in this flock it's a major wintering area for both species this is very good because when we first went there we had to sort of deal with the atlantic states marine fisheries commission who was saying it wasn't the problem in delaware bay it was the problem in Cerro del fuego we uh, Hudsonian godwits don't go through the Delaware Bay, so we could compare these two populations, and we found that the knots were declining, and the Hudsonian godwits were not. Now, the reason it's such a great place for the birds to winter is that uh, there's a 30-foot tide here, and Bay of Lomas has a five-kilometer-wide inner tidal zone. So you can see the birds right here. They're just moving in and out with the tide every day. 
There's plenty of clams all along the shoreline. A great place to winter. We found that the population in Cerro del Fuego had crashed from about 65,000 birds. It's down to as little as 9,000. Uh, right now, it's about 14,000. So now the birds are leaving uh, Lago de Peche through, I mean, uh, Cerro del Fuego. They're hopping up the coast, and then they get to Lago de Peche, Brazil. That's where they're going to make the flight to Delaware Bay. So uh, they go up the coast here to the go to Pesh. And the go to Pesh is basically a lagoon and then really wild uh, beaches. Uh, this lagoon has, supports a local fishery for small, small shrimp, like bay shrimp. And, uh, but most of the area is unpopulated. What's unusual about uh, this place uh, is the tide. So this map shows, here's the continent, and then each of these are the tidal ranges. So the darker it is, the bigger the tidal range. So you could see Cerro del Fuego here is black. And uh, you can see the Gulf of Mexico is light because there's only about a two foot tide. And see, now you can see why the birds are at uh, Lagoa de Pesh. It's only a two foot tide but it has Atlantic coast level productivity. So really abundant clams in this uh, area so they're able to build up. Problems here are uh, hard to, to, we're not sure yet. We're working with the team down there uh, uh, with the uh, UNISO University. Disturbance is a problem because people are just using the beach as a, as a road. Um, but the, there might be a bigger problem with contaminants because we found birds that were uh, struggling. Like this knot uh, couldn't escape the scavenger caracaras. So something was making the birds uh, sick. I it, Possibly that it's red tides like they have in Florida and Texas. I've been in red tides in, uh, in Texas and it, it, the toxins from the dead fish just uh, impair everything. We, we had uh, dead knots there from the red tides in Texas. So I, we're not sure what's going on here, but just another threat. So now Delaware Bay, this is the, you know, now we're completing the circle. Once they leave Delaware Bay, they go on to the Arctic. The big thing about Delaware Bay is that it's at the largest horseshoe crab population in the world. And it's basically because of the bay has this just perfect conditions for crab. It's, it's, uh, the whole bay is an average of about 12 feet deep. It has the, you know, the channel in the center. So it warms up quickly. And that, that means that the crabs and the birds sort of link up uh, well. The, the people who live in Delaware Bay have always considered horseshoe crabs worthless. They used them as fertilizer until there were chemical fertilizers available. Um, and then uh, in a sort of version of that, uh, the, during the 70s and 80s, you know, a lot of the Atlantic Coast fisheries were collapsing. Cod fishery was collapsing in New England. They started looking for something else. They started taking conk because they were shipping it overseas and it were making money. They needed bait, so they started taking horseshoe crabs. By uh, 1998, they were taking 2.5 million. They're still taking crabs now at about this level. Uh, we're trying to stop them. I'm going to finish off with that, with the Horseshoe Crab Coalition. Um, you know, this is what it looks like. You know, numbers are hard to imagine. This was a film done in 1986 before they overharvested the crab. This is what it looks like now. And this is the best of condition. See, it's a big difference here. First of all, when you get to the eggs at this level, at the upper level, they're baked into the beach. So it doesn't matter what happens. You know, it could be cold water. Crabs could stop spawning for some reason, but the eggs that are buried in the sand 
are just going to keep continually coming out because of wave action. What happens now is that any crazy, any perturbation in the system is going to stop things and then the birds suffer. So that happened in 2020. The water got cold. The horse crab spawn stopped dead and uh, there was nothing for the birds. The, um, in 1987, there was a cold year and there was no impact just because of that superabundance of hay. So red knots crashed along, you know, the, what we were seeing in Cerro del Fuego was the reaction to Delaware Bay. Last year, we saw 6,800 knots. That doesn't mean that the population has crashed down to there. It's very likely that we're still at this level, but, uh, and the birds just had to find somewhere else. See, the problem is there's increased mortality because they're trying to find somewhere else because Delaware Bay is the best. So what's the solution? How are we gonna fix this for the future? I mean, that's what we're thinking about. How do, you, how do you fix a problem like this that has so many different aspects? It's overwhelming. The answer is this. It comes from the crabs themselves. Now see, we, we were wrong when we uh, started our project and we were all about protecting the birds because the main value of horseshoe crabs was the estuary itself. It wasn't to the birds. Those egg, most of those eggs that you saw in that clip, they were going into the sea. And once those ha those, the eggs that were buried, once they hatched, they're feeding fish. You see all these uh, minnows coming in and feeding on these young horseshoe crabs. See, the horseshoe crab was a, a dynamo of energy for the Delaware Bay ecosystem. It wasn't just, they weren't just helping horseshoe crabs. They were energizing the entire ecosystem. Now, uh, the, the guy who is generally considered to be sort of the grandfather of horseshoe crabs on Delaware Bay is Carl Schuster. And in 1960s, he recognized it. He found that fish were feeding on all these, all these fish were feeding on the eggs. And see, what's important is it was the eels, the killifish, the silver sides. They were feeding the sport fish. And see, we can't get the fisheries agencies to recognize this. Now, there's, uh, I want you to recognize this as the sign of hope because all of the cheekbones are still there. It's just bad management that's going on right now. So look at, look at what happened to weak fish. Weak fish were like the engine of Delaware Bay economy. They, they were, uh, you know, all the marinas were filled up with boats, uh, you know, restaurants, motels. Delaware Bay was a, a place equal to the Atlantic coast, but for sport, sportsmen, they're fishers. In uh, the early 90s, they were taking, Delaware, New Jersey was taking upwards of 3 million pounds of weak fish a year. Now they're taking 44,000. We can't get the fisheries agencies to recognize that the crab was the problem. The, if you ask the, the state fisheries or federal fisheries people, what's the problem with weak fish? They'll tell you something like, oh, there's too many dolphins. Because they, they, they won't recognize the crab as the engine of productivity for Delaware Bay. So the solution, in other words, is to restore the crab. And it isn't just restore the crab in Delaware Bay. It's restore the crab in every place that they occur. So your source food crab population from Maine to Florida. And see, it's our theory without any evidence because it was all lost before anybody collected evidence is that the shorebirds weren't concentrated in Delaware Bay. They were using stopovers all along the Atlantic coast because they were fertile. They were, they were a bun there was abundant resources in all the resources, all the estuarine systems. And so that's why we started the Horseshoe Crab Recovery Coalition. We're at 45 groups right now, uh, a wide variety of groups from the Anger, Anglers Conservation Network to the Humane Society. 
I mean, and every everybody in between, NRDC, Delaware Riverkeeper, American Literal Society. Uh, Susan Linder is is uh, on the the, the uh, she's on video there, and she's the um, she works on Horseshoe Crabs with a colleague as as part of the Horseshoe Crab Coalition. See, our goal is to uh, increase horseshoe crabs everywhere they occur. So like this year, we have six, we're establishing six state groups. And so, uh, and each of those state groups are going to conduct uh, surveys, they're going to do stewardship for shorebirds and so on. So I, I didn't cover all the issues here because there's too many, like uh, the uh, horseshoe crab, like everybody thinks the horseshoe crab is valuable because of bait. But that's the secret that multinational companies are trying to hide. The real value of horseshoe crabs is their blood. I mean, a, a crab is worth about $5 as bait. For blood, we don't know what the estimate is because they keep all the data secret, but we estimated somewhere about $300 a crab per year. And these people won't participate in restoration. They're hiding. Go to the state newspaper, it's a South Carolina newspaper, and follow the articles by Kira Eisner of the bleeding company that bleeds half the, the horseshoe crabs. Or over 600,000 crabs are bled a year. And this one company is uh, doing half of it. Read about how good a, a company they are. Anyway, I think we're going to solve this. And I think the, the reason uh, is because of what I said about the horseshoe crabs. For Delaware Bay, I think the reason is because all the, the structure of the bay still exists. Most of the marsh is publicly owned. Uh, it's, there's groups like uh, American Literal Society, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, trying to restore habitat. Now it's like all of this. The bones are there. We just got to change uh, the management. And the best way to do that is with your help. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. If you have questions, please put them in chat. There are some already. I'll get, I'll get to them in a moment. All right, can I ask an, an overarching question to kind of begin? Sure. Why and how does a 10,000 mile migration evolve? Like it's so much work for the bird. I'm curious about the, the why of it. How, to, how did that evolve that it has to go from Terra del Fuego to the Arctic Circle? Yeah, I, it's a good question, Mike. It's one that um, is, you know, subject of researchers worldwide. Like it, the knot has, has uh, you know, the, it has a following, like not just wildlife people, but there's a lot of smart people that enjoy tagging red knots, you know, banding them, that sort of thing, because their migration is a puzzle. And so the best idea right now is that, you know, you look at it in terms of fitness. So, you know, a bird is maximizing fit, fitness is like the ability to make young. And so the birds that go to Terra del Fuego lose fitness because they have that long migration. They gain fitness because it's identical to the Arctic. There's no parasites, there's no diseases, there's no red tides. The birds that go to south to uh, Florida or Caribbean, they gain fitness because it's shorter, but they lose it because parasites, diseases. And so it's, a, it's, it's an important aspect for conservation because the, the impact of you know, not caring for the stopovers is that the long distance not have plummeted. They're now one sixth of their population. But the short distance birds have stayed more or less the same because they don't have the same threat. But they have the long-term threat. Like if we put all our eggs essentially in short distance baskets and there's a red tide in the main wintering area, that's the end of it you've lost your species. So the, the long run, it's better to do that long migration. That's great, thank you. 
So keep putting questions in. I'll start getting to them now. And it's um it's like 10 up. We'll go until just like five after eight. Uh, Jenny and Paul want to know what determines which bird is short or long term. How does the bird know which way to go? How far? Another good question. See, uh, we know that there's morphological distance a difference in the bird. So we know that it's genetic. So it's not just like a bird that goes to Brazil, a bird that goes to Cerro Fuego, a bird that goes to Florida, they all have different beak sizes or wing sizes. And so that means there has to be distinction in the Arctic, because that's the only way that you can have genetic distinction. Uh, you know, in reality, like if you have a bird in August, it's not molting, you can't tell if it's long or short because it could be flying to the Florida wintering area and then molting there, or it could go to Third El Fuego uh, and it could molt there. Uh, but see, it, it, it still allows us, we, we still, the birds that do molt in the stopover and bring in the Atlantic uh, Stone Harbor or Monomoy, if it's molting, we know it's short distance. If it's not molting, it could still be going to Florida. Thank you. Eric has a question that I had as well about the peregrine falcons. Did you say that they hadn't normally evolved in that environment? Um, or that they weren't there prior to uh, prior because of avoiding predation by owls? Yeah, see, so the, uh, I worked on peregrines when I was a young biologist. Yeah. Um, the, uh, see, the eastern population was ex extirpated. And so the object was to get them back. And because there were no breeding pairs, you couldn't just manage your way out of it. So they had to be hatched. In other words, the young Iases had to be raised in a box. And then when they reached fledging age, they would fledge on their own. So you, and that way, eventually they would come back. So when they first did it, the Peregrine Fund first did it, they tried to hack birds out of boxes in cliffs where all the peregrines nested. Like when there was a population, they were in the water gap. They were up in New Hampshire. They weren't on the coast. And uh, so then uh, that didn't work because the great, hand great horned owls were eating all the ice. They couldn't fledge any. So they uh, proposed and I helped execute uh, creating boxes out on the marsh because there were no great horned owls. And so uh, ice could be released. The problem was they came back and started nesting in their towers. So, you know, it was a good idea during the time when there was, you know, it used to be five, we estimated that there was 1.5 million shorebirds on Delaware Bay in 1980. So a few peregrines didn't make any difference at all. But now we're down to somewhere around 200,000. Oh and on the Atlantic coast, it's even less. So, you know, now's the time to get rid of the, see that the state is still managing peregrines on the Atlantic coast. They're still maintaining the towers. They're checking on them, you know, sort of artificially subsidizing them. And that should end. That's, that's all I'm saying. You can't do anything about migrating peregrines. I mean, right. the birds evolved for that. Right. Great. Sandy grew up in Cliffwood Beach, Keyport, Raritan Bay, Monmouth County. There was a large horseshoe population crab when she lived there in the 60s through 2000, she remembers. Would you find any red knots there or any similar migratory birds? So in Monmouth County in Northern New Jersey? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a question that's real relevant to our work. Susan is helping to start a, uh, a state working group. And uh, one of the groups is the, um, uh, Susan, I forget the name of the group that does the work there. Uh, uh, Save Coastal Wildlife. Yeah. So uh, uh, if you're interested in helping out on Raritan Bay, uh, that's a group to go to or to the coalition. Uh, before they were, you know, those crabs are really taking a hit because New York is unrepentant. I mean, they're, they're landing 200,000. They can land up to 200,000 a year. The, the evidence is that they're taking them from uh, Delaware Bay because there's a 
genetic evidence is that there's 40, 44% are Delaware Bay origin. The rest are taken from Rampton Bay, very likely, and Jamaica Bay, but it, that's pretty small. They're keeping the population low. If, there was, if that stopped, if there was no more bait harvest and there was no more blood kill, that population would get up to egg density again, and it would be yeah. a stopover again. No question about it. They're beautiful bag. And Cindy also asked, what about the harvesting of horseshoe crab blood and the effects of that? You touched on that. And what's uh, it harvested for? Can you say what it's for? The, the blood is blue too, right? Yeah, so the, they, it, they take the blood for um, the biochemical lysate, which is a, a, a biochemical that detects uh, biocontaminants. So basically everything goes in your body, drugs, you know, uh, pacemakers, joints, whatever, it's all tested by lysate. They used to have to use a rabbit. And so this was an advance using uh, horseshoe crab blood. Um, it's, uh, it, they do a, an eight minute bleed. Uh, females, they could take as much as 50% of their blood. Mm. Uh, the estimates are that there's a significant mortality. The companies because of a quirk of fisheries rules, uh, get to keep all their data secret. Uh, the independent assessment of mortality was 30%. The companies estimate 5%. These are all international companies, Japanese, Swedish. You know, these are not like local mom and pop operations like they pretend. Right. Um, and uh, the after bleeding is almost unresearched. And the data that uh, suggests uh, significant mortality as well, it's a $500 million industry. That I bristle at the word harvest because harvest implies planning and stewardship. And right. these people are just, you know, taking. There's no. And are there new alternatives now for? Yeah. Oh, save it. We have something to yeah, save. Yeah, thanks for that, Mike. No, there's a there's a bio, there's a new synthetic called RSC. It's actually not new. It was there was the patent for it was uh, entered uh, almost 15 years ago. One of the companies bought it and sat on it for 10 years. Uh, the patent's now open. Uh, Eli Lilly is using it for new products. Uh, Pfizer is. Uh, contemplating it. The European Pharmacopeia has approved it for all uses. The U.S. Pharmacopeia, under the influence of the main bleeding company, uh, Charles River, uh, was convinced that it's not equivalent to lysate. Uh, the Europeans think it is. The Asians think it is. Right. Eli Lilly thinks it is. And Lilly's um, part of your coalition, right? I saw their right. logo. Yeah. That's right. So this is something that's going to change. It's, uh, most of the bleeding companies have a synthetic uh, alternative. Only Charles River doesn't. Uh, but you know, eventually, uh, will uh, this this will convert? It's going to take time, though. We we're talking to uh, a, a woman from uh, Humane Society International today, and she said that in foreign countries like India. Uh, they're used to LAL, it's coming from here. And um, uh, so there's a whole system around it. So it's gonna take right. time to change that system. But I, I think eventually it'll happen. Okay. You see, I think the, the good thing about it is that once we convert to RFC, I'm pretty sure the bait harvest will end because uh, the bleeders are propping up the bait harvest with shenanigans, like they call it. Uh, rent a crab program and stuff like that. Uh, Elizabeth wonders if the harvesting rules were recently loosened up, allowing the harvesting of females. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that. Uh, yes, it's a major battle. So the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which was responsible for the management, the, the management is actually implemented by each of the states, but the ASMSB determines the quotas. And um, so uh, I'm on the committee that determines the quota, which has been males only for the last uh, eight years or something, because 
there's no increase in the crab or the birds. Um, things are worse now than they were 10 years ago, but magically the ASMSC uh, developed a increase. They added new uh, surveys that they uh, eschewed before. Uh, and, um, and they want to open up the female harvest, which is closed right now. So uh, several groups are aiming to oppose it. I wrote a, a, a minority opinion about it, as did uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service member on the Arms Committee, but the group went ahead and moved it forward. They're uh, going to approve it this spring meeting. And so then there'll probably be uh, legal battles over that. I can't say much more about that until develop. We're gonna go for a few more minutes. Judy wonders about the effects of offshore wind um, on knots and other migratory shorebirds. Yeah, these are really good questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of the satellite work is being funded by the offshore wind companies. We, we work, I have a small company called Wildlife Restoration Partnership, uh, which um, Susan is part of as well. And uh, so uh, we've been getting funding and working with the Fish and Wildlife Service on tracking and uh, using satellite transmitters because they're very expensive. And uh, I have to say that I had never really seen that before. As you, I said, I was part of the, uh, I was head of the Endangered Species Program. So I did a lot of mitigations and permitting and all that stuff. And I've never seen a, a sort of collaboration of company and, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, you know, really trying to get to the answer on whether there's an impact because it's it's so important to have wind power from a, you know, energy standpoint. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're trying to determine if the birds are in over the wind farm, that's the first thing, whether they're in the altitude, which is the second thing, and whether they actually get hit by the blade. Uh, so it's still an ongoing project, uh, but, you know, Oh, I think everybody on the has the perspective that we need to do this. We just got to figure out how. You got it. Uh, Susan Linder, who um, Larry has mentioned a couple of times, I'll put uh, something in chat about the Safe Coastal Wildlife Organization in Raritan Bay. Check that out. Uh, Tracy has some homeschoolers who have some questions. When is the best time to see the red knots in New Jersey and are they endangered? Yes, red knots are endangered which is a really great thing because it opens up all kinds of regulatory protection. And so they get a lot from that. Um, the best time is during the month of May. And uh, the best time in May is like the second, third week. Second week is- It's a great Mother's Day crowd. project. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the third week is uh, where the sort of peak is. Crab spawn is usually the full moon or new moon, so you could just time it. The best thing is to time it with that, and then the birds will very likely be there. Uh, the state of New Jersey and uh, American Literal Society and other groups, uh, the Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey uh, have Stewart on each of the access points. You could go to either one of those groups to get information on where is the best place. There's stewards there will help you understand. There's some uh, signage. And uh, so uh, like we encourage people to come see, kids especially, uh, but at each place there's like a boundary where uh, people can't crawl onto the beach, which is really good because the birds come right up to the boundary. You know, you can touch horseshoe crabs. It's a good, right. good learning experience. That's great. Are they endangered? Not, not officially, right? No, I'm sorry, uh, red knots. No, red knots are federally threatened and uh, they're state uh, listed as well. Uh, yeah, that's that's one of the big uh, uh, the sort of bulwarks of the whole protection. If they weren't, it, it's not just that they're not, uh, it's the protection of red knots, but all the shorebirds sort of carried on the back of the red knot because uh, they're all getting, uh, benefits from the protection of stopovers and wintering areas and the research. Right. 
So we'll end on Jerry's question and I'll first give the statement then a question. Uh, Jerry has watched dories come into the Hyannis docks in Cape Cod with garbage cans full of horseshoe crabs. When they were asked if they would return them to where they took them, they said they're returning them to Woods Hole miles away. Um, and then Jerry wonders, how can we stop, help to stop the harvesting of horseshoe crabs? Yeah. Yeah, Massachusetts is, uh, you know, if you look for the places that are killing the most crabs, it's Massachusetts and Maryland. Um, uh, it's, we're having a hard time getting things going in Massachusetts, like, you know, South Carolina, Georgia, state groups are vibrant, you know, Maryland, Delaware, Massachusetts, it's really hard to get action. Wow. Uh, I, I guess I would say, uh, try to work through Mass Audubon. Uh, it's a good group uh, with limited focus on now, the problem is the, the bleeding companies like Charles River and uh, uh, Cape Cod Associates are housed in Massachusetts. So they got a real big political influence. Yeah. You got a big road to hoe there. Yeah. Uh, this go this is more common sense chat about. Go, go to go the ahead. Horseshoe yep. Crab website and we'll try to steer yep. you to a good place. Yep. Okay. Everybody should think that. Dr. Niles, thank you so, so much for giving us this update tonight. We so appreciate it. And thank you for many, many decades of work on this important, extraordinary conservation story. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. I, it was my pleasure to give that talk. And everybody, my favorite portion of the evening, feel free to unmute yourself and thank Larry for his work and for the program tonight. So feel free to unmute and offer your thanks. Thank, thank, you, you, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Great, great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So much. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your knowledge, Larry. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. From Massachusetts. So we need your help. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, we're actually going to Massachusetts in uh, August, a trap with Fish and Wildlife Service. Good. Oh, really? We're working there. Yeah. Okay. The problem is, yep. is huge, as you said there. Huge. Yeah. Very huge. <laughs> thank you for political. zooming in from Massachusetts. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. We want come, to come we, see the Delaware we need all the ideas we can get. <laughs> you got it. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Yeah. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great bye. night. And again, Larry, thank, thank you. you so so much. Thank you all. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.